The next section we're going to cover is assessments. We talked at the beginning about the differences between instructing and evaluating, and that's why we don't call this evaluations when we're not talking about stand evals. Assessments is not about evaluating whether a student is or isn't capable. That's not necessarily what you're looking for in any individual event. You're looking for an assessment of where they are in the curriculum compared to where they should be and areas in which they have either achieved the intended level of performance or they haven't. And now, now that's not to say that you can't have a, an unsatisfactory event. Uh, assessments that result in an event that is graded unsatisfactory are based on a premise that um, if the student's overall performance either meets uh, in the dot seven curriculum one of the auto failure criteria or just overall does not constitute a satisfactory event that's not a reflection that the student is not capable it's a reflection that the student is not ready to move on from that event because they have not achieved the required uh, or desired level of performance on that particular event our primary venue for conducting assessments is the debrief. Any debrief should begin with truth data. You want to start with the things you know. Resources that you can use for this include PCDS debrief tool, video recording in from the aircraft of your uh, FLIR footage, can include notes taken during the event by the instructor, by additional crew members, by the student, by a range training officer or other other white cell participant. In addition to truth data, you're going to want to cover any deviations right away in the debrief. These could be safety of flight issues, training rule violations, uh, larger flight rule violations. That's stuff that you want to get to right away and cover because those are going to be your most serious or significant debrief points. Then when it comes to assessment, you're looking for your smaller deviations. What things didn't necessarily measure up to the required level of performance. It's not necessary to debrief everything that went well. Now, that said, as we talked about at the beginning, providing some positive feedback and, and building up that student's confidence is important in them retaining information and progressing through the syllabus. So the entire debrief shouldn't just focus exclusively on the negative aspects without acknowledging positive aspects, but there really isn't a need to debrief a departure that was uneventful or a transition to a range in which nothing necessarily happened. Um, those are the kind of things that belabor debriefs and uh, tune people out. They're not paying attention anymore and they're no longer able to uh, receive the important uh, measures that you are looking to provide. So for that reason, you want to focus on where did things not go according to plan, either according to our intended plan as briefed or our uh, basic TTPs or our training rules, and then try to identify causal factors. What was it that caused that? Was it something in mission planning? Was it something in the brief? Is it attack admin point? Is it something that happened as a matter of execution? And this is where you can, again, drill down where we talked about errors in terms of slips or mistakes. When things went wrong, was the causal factor that the student was attempting to do something correctly and just didn't land it? Or was it that they were attempting to do something wrong because the maneuver as they understood it or the technique as they understood it was incorrect and they did what they meant to do, they just meant to do the wrong thing? All those causal factors should feed into lessons learned, something that that student can take forward to future events and apply it in order to prevent making the same mistakes or causing the same deviations. If the student at the end of the debrief it just comes away with a feeling of, oh, I didn't do very well, the instructor said this, 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 and the other thing went wrong, that's not as helpful to the student as taking uh, forward to future events specific applicable teaching interventions. One way to get the most out of an instructional fix or a teaching intervention is that facilitating of self-assessment. The more your student can provide, can identify those deviations from the intended standard, can identify the causal factors, and can produce their own lessons learned, they're much more likely to stick with them than if you as the instructor are just uh, 
throwing at them all of these things that were not done correctly or uh, that needed to be done differently, the more the students can self-assess, the more likely they are to take that information forward and use it productively. So when we talk about assessments, there are a couple rules for what makes good assessments, and this applies kind of across debriefs. They gotta be objective, flexible, acceptable, comprehensive, and constructive. So objective, uh, right off the bat, that's where these measures of performance in our syllabi, either the dot six or if you're up to the dot seven, are your tools as an instructor to show that this isn't personally motivated. This doesn't have anything to do with uh, the student themselves, their personality. This is specifically about we have set standards, they're defined in our curriculum guide, and the student either did or didn't meet those standards. But assessments also need to be flexible. They have to account for alibis that were on the event, real world things that transpired. A student may have made a mistake, violated a training rule, or not complied with a normal uh, technique or procedure, but it may have been driven by some kind of outside factor where uh, maybe another aircraft or another player in the event either gave them bad information or executed their own TTPs in a non-standard manner that forced the student uh, into a situation in which they uh, were not uh, used to or it there was not necessarily a clear-cut answer. The debrief also has to be acceptable to the student and this is one of those areas again where especially on the military side you can see instructors who say I'm the instructor I'm giving them the feedback they you know it's not up to me to present it in an acceptable manner but if you actually want to change your student's behavior if you want to produce a student who is improving and is able to do the things you're trying to teach them you have to give them an ass the assessment in a way that they can accept. Um, and this kind of comes down to, you know, if you're coming in screaming and yelling, foaming at the mouth, cursing at them, telling them all the things they did wrong, right? Your student's not gonna accept that. They're just gonna tune you out, they're gonna be bitter, they're uh, gonna just try to get through to the end of it. If you approach them in the role of teacher and mentor and confront them with this idea that you want them to get better, you want them to be successful, you want them to be able to operate safely and then someday instruct their own events safely and as a result it's important to you that they be good at these maneuvers or these uh, procedures and that the reason you are providing this feedback, even if it's not you know positive necessarily, is that you care about your student and you want them to be successful, be safe, and be uh, a productive member of the squadron. It's also important that assessments be comprehensive. You have to cover all of the things on uh, the event, all the card, if you leave big chunks of the event out uh, or undiscussed, then, your student's gonna think you're just maybe cherry picking certain specific events where they didn't do well. Uh, that's why when we talk about those debriefs, it's not necessary to debrief in depth all of the portions of the event that went normally, but it's important to acknowledge them. You can say, we departed the airfield, course rules to the east, and arrived and conducted our range check-ins uneventfully, that all went well. That's you know 10 or 15 seconds devoted there, you've covered it, and you don't have to go into any more depth than that, but the student understands that uh, it did go well, they did do it correctly, and you don't need to anchor on it because uh, that's exactly how they should do it again in the future. And then lastly, the assessment needs to be constructive. Again, if it's personally motivated, if you're talking about things about the student that aren't uh, captured in the training curriculum, if you're talking about that their you know, voice sounds weird or you don't like the way they write or talk, it's one thing if they're not using proper brevity or phraseology, um, but if you're just attacking you know, the way your student looks or acts, it's not necessarily a constructive debrief and it leads to an increased likelihood that your student is gonna ignore the actual useful portions of the assessment. So this is why we use those measures of performance. They're standardized metrics for evaluating your student performance and 
We have them in the dot six and the dot seven on the FAA side. They're including what call, what's called airman certification standards, uh, what used to be called practical test standards. And on the FAA side, uh, those, those ACS standards only apply for check rides for their Stan eval equivalents. But some more formalized schools also employ cur curriculums uh, like ours, where each individual event is assessed along measures of performance as well. And it doesn't matter, you know, we keep these measures of performance very generic, partly so that we can freely talk about them online, uh, but also because the actual specific measure of performance isn't as important as how we apply it, right? So the measure of performance for a line item of pen holding, we might have defined autofill criteria like we do in the dot seven curriculum that says it's automatically an unsat if say the pen falls on the ground. And the standard at this level, say level two pen holding, maybe level three pen holding, is students should hold the pen with one hand at arm's length perpendicular to the floor while minimizing pen movement. And you'll see that there are some things here that are really easy to identify. Is it at arm's length? Is it being held with one hand? Is it perpendicular to the floor? Those things, if it's uh, not those, if they're holding it with two hands, if it's in close to their body, if it's you know, parallel to the floor, you can say, okay, that's easy, you know, didn't meet the standard. And then oftentimes with measures of performance, you're gonna have some things that are a little bit harder to interpret uh, consistently from an instructor to instructor, like in this case, minimizing pen movement. Well, how, how minimum is minimum? And that may vary between instructors and that's where it can be useful to hold instructor standardization meetings for your squadron or your command where you talk about what are our uh, standards for these things so that students are getting consistent assessments throughout the syllabus and they're not having some instructors tell them, yeah, no, that's a good job. And then the next instructor after they perform the exact same way says, oh, that's not up to standards. Those areas where we see some room for interpretation in the measures of performance are most often in the areas in which it can be very hard to objectively measure the student's performance. So this might be in areas like section leadership um, or radio communications where you're saying, okay, what constitutes you know, satisfactory or unsatisfactory radio communications in general? It's easy to think, think of some things that are definitely unsatisfactory, but there's a lot of gray area. And that's why as an instructor, you wanna be able to articulate to your student why you assessed their ability where you did.